Yeah. Good afternoon, friends. And as we all grow in life, we've always learned that negotiation has always been an art which has to be learned. They say that I was reading as well as hearing one session, which said that even as a child, they start negotiating with the parents. And how they budge and how the parents budge is ultimately where we narrow down. And the mediation starts in that process in that, that way itself. You negotiate with the vendor, you negotiate with your employer, the employee negotiates with other employees that whether he can do the work or not. But today's session would be on negotiation. And yesterday when we had Justice Roshan Dalvi, a uh, former judge from Bombay High Court, while she was taking the session on shared parenting, she gave a, a streak of an idea of the negotiation. And then we said that today's session would be on the negotiation skills in the mediation. When she learned that, she, she that day, uh, yesterday itself promised that I will join. And in the morning also the message. So one thing from what we can learn from Justice Roshan Dalvi is that always that desire, that hunger to learn is what makes you a better person. And that's why when, as and when you request Justice Roshan Dalvi, she's always been so ready and willing to take these sessions and she's so popular. And without saying that Mr. Jawad, those who have been connected, not only on Beyond Law, but if you see in the LinkedIn, it seems that he's amongst the top uh, mediator trainers. And that's one of the things that I keep on negotiating with him, that Mr. Jawad, you have to come on the platform and share the knowledge. And somehow I've been successful in negotiating that, not because of my pervasive skills, but he believes that in a mediation that you have to give more and the, despite the fact that you may not succeed in whatever in the pursuit is. But in that process, I've seen Mr. Jawad sharing his insights on different perspectives. And negotiation is one skill, which I think that we are probably learning today from one of the best mediators who can make us understand those things. And what Mr. Jawad's in the mind is coming that probably he will not disappoint. I, I know that he will not disappoint. So we don't take that thing forward, but we only say that you can take the things forward, except that you won't disappoint us. Over to you. <laughs> I'll just no, ask uh, Mr. Jawad, uh, just to give a brief introduction by Justice Roshan Dabi, because this subject is also quite close to him. Over to you, ma'am. Oh, good afternoon, friends, and good afternoon, Vikas. Uh, I, I'm, I have really come to hear Mr. Jawad and not to speak, but uh, I may say that this skill of negotiation that you will be learning today is something new, uh, something different. And uh, as Mark Twain said, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you have always got. So we, have, we really want to get something else out of our dispute resolution system. And uh, I may say that in, on the international field, this is now taking such strong roots that it is so good that Mr. Jawad is here with us on our national scene. Uh, on the international scene, it is multi-party interest-based negotiation, facilitation, mediation, and conciliation. That is what has come to be. And they call it conflict resolution. And people like Dr. Mr. Javad are conflict resolutionists to bring about peace. You know. So I don't think uh, we require anything else uh, to be said about this matter. Uh, about the about the content of the course, but uh, Mr. Javed would uh, take us further than what we always felt mediation was. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, and uh, uh, you provided a nice launch pad for me to start the yeah. discussion. Uh, and thank you, Vikash, very much. Uh, Vikash is like a brother. The uh, problem with Vikash is I can never say no to him. So. <laughs> Whenever he asks me to do something, I just do it. Uh, only thing I would just like to tell all of you that right now I'm not too well. Like I have a very bad throat. So uh, whenever I get a coughing fit, I may be putting off my camera and my mic because I don't want you to see me coughing or hear my croaking sounds. So please don't think that I have switched off or something. It's just because I just, I'm just I'll be just trying to overcome my coughing. <clears throat> so. Uh, well, I think uh, it was a nice uh, background that both uh, Vikash and uh, uh, Madam uh, 
portion that we uh, gave us to start off a negotiating a negotiation and right now i am negotiating with the butterflies in my stomach because we have such stalwart uh, here on the screen and uh, so that really makes you nervous so but negotiation is going on within me and i'm telling myself don't get too nervous you can do it so let's hope i'm able to do it <laughs> so uh, friends as uh, vikash also said we are always you know uh, negotiating with each other because uh, we are sometimes negotiating with us then whether we should get up in the morning uh, what time we should get up what dress we should wear what food should we eat and we are negotiating with our family members we are negotiating with our friends we are negotiating i mean negotiation is something which is all pervasive in our modern modern social life now what we normally understand from negotiation like today morning also i was uh, judging a negotiation competition and i was uh, telling the students same thing i said that okay when you start negotiate negotiating what do you do like for example let me give you an example like let's say that you know i have a car to sell and uh, vikash approaches me and says that uh, jawad i heard that you are selling your car uh, and i tell him that yes i'm selling my car and he says uh, how much are you asking for it now what i do is vikash is a very close and dear friend of mine and i don't want to you know uh, tell him the price that i'm expecting for the car because i feel that you know i'll offend him if i quote too high a price <clears throat> so i tell him vikash if you're buying it you tell me the price and vikash says that uh, here i can offer you about 6 lakhs for the car and what i'm expecting is about 8 or 9 lakhs in the market but what i do is i don't want to disappoint vikash because i value his friendship too much and uh, i tell him that fine vikash that's all right with me to take the car now this is what is called as a soft negotiation and uh, normally when we are dealing with our friends when we are dealing with our close family members or when we are dealing uh, in a situation where uh, we value the relationship a lot and we don't want to really you know affect the relationship in any way we indulge in soft negotiation the other kind of negotiation is the hard negotiation so let's imagine that vikash and i don't know each other and uh, vikash approaches me and says that mr jawad i heard that you're selling your car and how much are you asking for it and uh, my expected price is about 8 or 9 lakhs and i tell him that uh, oh mr vikash i i expect about 12 lakhs at least for the car and vikash tells me look that's too high how can you ask for 12 lakhs this car is not even worth 5 or 6 lakhs so you know this is the hard negotiation so what we try to do in a hard negotiation is we try to win and uh, we always want to you know get the best deal for ourselves and we are not really concerned about where the other person is coming from and what exactly the other person need so this is the kind of negotiation that normally we do that's how the world knew negotiation until these two chaps came along from harvard they are roger fisher and william yuri i don't know if uh many of you may have heard the name or not heard the name but they have written a book called Re- getting to yes so most of today's discussion is going to be on uh what the kind of negotiation that they propounded so they said that look you don't have to lose you don't have to win why can't it be that both of you get what you need and without compromising on your interests so they said that there are certain things that we need to bear in mind when we go in for a negotiation we always go in with our position it's always what i want like i when i negotiate with vikash then he is not my friend and if vikash is a stranger to me i go with the position that i need to you know get the best possible price for this car and though i know that it is valued at only about 9 or 10 lakhs i i quote a very high price and i somehow want to convince vikash to buy it for as high price as i can get from it. so in the bargain what happens is if vikash falls for it i win and vikash loses now in the first type of negotiation when we are friends what happens is vikash wins or i lose and what happens i ultimately end up feeling very bad because 3 to 4 lakhs is a big amount and i have lost it so i don't feel too happy about it 
but what to do i value my friendship so i don't feel like you know arguing with vikash or demanding a higher price for so what these two guys uh, william yuri and roger fisher said was look you don't have to do that so what you need to do is you always go with your positions but why don't you try to understand what are the interests of the other person and try to understand what your own interests are ask a question to yourself what is most important what is it that you cannot do without what is the best thing that can happen to you why is it so important and what happens if you don't get it so they said ask yourself these questions that will help you to understand what your real interests are and they said that okay you don't have to really you know uh, settle for something like uh, your price or their price you can always settle for something which is very objective and you can you know establish a criteria in which you test the real value of the product uh, of whatever you're dealing with whatever you're negotiating on and get the best possible deal for yourself and for the other side also so what is important here is asking the right question and understanding the interests of the other party and also understanding your own interests so once you understand the interests automatically you understand what is it that you need what is the best thing that you can get out so what do you need to do about it? how do how are you going to get about it? go about getting what you want what you need so what they called as the pin pyramid so you have positions you have interests and you have needs so when you bargain on position you don't get anywhere because you are stuck on the position it's always about what you want and you're not concerned about what the other person wants when you go into the interest you'll realize that there is an overlapping of interest now let's imagine that okay i'll come to the example later on but once you understand your interest your needs become crystallized and you know that what is it that you can really settle for it may not be what your position says that you want it is what is important for you and what is it that you cannot do without so you go in for something that is acceptable to you and also acceptable to the other party so they came up with four things that you need to do to have a principle negotiation they said that don't make it a battle of wit don't make it me versus them or us versus them separate the people from the problem don't treat the person as the problem but understand that there is a problem and you need to negotiate with each other find a solution to the problem so once you understand that the person sitting opposite you is not your adversary is not your enemy it's not somebody whom you need to defeat to get your way once you understand that it becomes clear that okay both of us have a problem both of us need to get to a point and it's important for us to get there so what do we do and then they said that once you have separated the people from the problem <coughs> focus on the interest don't get stuck on your position jawab i am for a minute muting everyone then you unmute yourself because uh, we had unmuted everyone because yes. for that there is some disruption yes i am for a minute muting then i will allow you the unmuting you and okay. judge roshan okay. thank you okay. thanks for that so they said focus on the interest because what is the most important thing what is driving this? what is it that you need to really get so once you focus on your interest you are able to understand that okay my position may not be the right way to look at it if i want a compensation of 10 lakhs <coughs> what is the justification for now in the morning when i was judging the competition i spoke about one of the teams came up with a very beautiful idea they made a list of their claims 
and they said that they split them into two parts. They said this is negotiable, this is non-negotiable. And they went on to explain that why this is negotiable and why that is non-negotiable. So they were able to explain their interests very beautifully. So the other side had to agree to that. And the other side agreed that, yes, this is important for you. And it's also important for us to find a solution for it. So focus on the interests. So first thing is separate the people from the problem. The second is focus on the interests, not on the position. And the third thing they said was, invent multiple options. Don't get stuck on any one solution. Don't think that that is the only way to resolve the problem. <coughs> Work with each other. Do some brainstorm. Try to see how you can find multiple options. Now, let me just finish with the last point and then I'll try to explain to you how this can perhaps work using the same car example that I gave you earlier. The fourth thing they said was evolve objective criteria. Now, what do you mean by objective criteria? So we, we all of us have our own cognitive bias. Okay. And we carry those biases into the negotiation. Just to give you a couple of examples of what are these biases. We have what is called, for example, an endowment effect. Like if it's something that belongs to me, I tend to value it much more. I sincerely believe that this is the real value. Of it. So that is called as endowment effect. The opposite of that is reactive devaluation. Now, when the same thing is in the hands of the other person, and I'm trying to get it, I devalue. I refuse to accept the real value of it. So these are just two of the cognitive biases. There are several. Now, there is not much time for us to go into all this cognitive bias. But what we need to understand is, we always approach a negotiation with these kind of biases in our mind. So the best way to achieve a good result is recognizing the fact that, yes, I have this bias. Now, what do we do? Why don't we establish a process by which we can objectively get a value of what we are dealing with? Perhaps ask an expert. Perhaps refer it to somebody who's a, who's, uh, who can give you the correct market value of some product. So why don't we have an objective criteria to evaluate the subject matter of the negotiation? So essentially what they said was, first, separate the people from the problem. Don't regard the other person as your adversary. Don't regard the other person as somebody whom you need to defeat in order to be able to win. Understand that both of you have a problem and both of you need to negotiate together. You have to collaborate to achieve a result that would work for both of you. The second thing they said was focus on your interest and the other person's interest because invariably those interests will always overlap. So focus on those interests. And the third thing they said was don't get bogged down by any one solution. Try to come up with multiple solutions. And the fourth thing they said was, evolve objective criteria for the evaluation of what you're negotiating, the subject matter of the negotiation, so that it is neither your value nor what the other person values it, because recognize the fact that, okay, you have these biases with you, so you may not come up with the correct value of it, so have some objective criteria to evaluate what you're talking about, what you're dealing with, the subject matter of the negotiation. Now, let me just illustrate this to you through the same example. Now, let's say that, you know, this uh, was called as principled negotiation by Roger Fisher and William. So what we discussed was first, soft negotiation, where we are friends, and there's the willingness to give in to each other, not to get the proper value of what we are dealing with. 
which leaves us with a bad taste in the mouth, a certain uh, level of disappointment, a certain level of frustration. The other is the hard negotiation, where it's always about winning the you know the negotiation and uh, you know putting the other side on the defensive or making the other side lose. And now what we are talking about is principled negotiation. So let us see how this would work in the same context of the car. So Vikash approaches me and says, uh, "Jawad, why you said you want to sell your car? Now, how much are you asking?" And I tell Vikash that, "Look, Vikash, my estimate of it is this much. Let's say about nine lakhs or ten lakhs. But since you are buying it, here's what we do." Perhaps my estimate may not be the correct market price. So why don't we get this car evaluated with somebody who's dealing in cars, a car dealer, perhaps, who will give us the correct value of the car? So now Vikash tells me that okay, we go to the dealer and he says that oh, the correct value of this car is nine lakh. Now there's an agreement between Vikash and me that okay, the price is going to be nine lakh. Now both of us are happy because it's a third person who has given us the valuation of the car. Now there's another issue. Vikash's budget is only six lakhs or seven lakhs, and Vikash needs the car. So what do we do? How do we go about? It? So this is where we start brainstorming. We work with each other. So Vikash tells me that Jawad, look, I bought this new iPhone. And it cost me about, you know, it co- usually iPhones cost a kidney or two. So he says that I bought it for about a lakh of rupees. I've opened the box, but I have not used it. So, would you like to have this phone? I can give you six lakhs in cash, and this is I can give you this phone. So I tell him that because okay, this is a good deal, and let me think about it. And I consider that, and I accept. It. Now, what happens about the balance? And I tell Vikash that Vikash, look, what is the time period you need to pay this? Can we have some staggered payment? Or Vikash, you have this bike which you're not using much. Would you like to also use it as a part of the swap? So it goes on. So you invent multiple options. So. Come to a, an agreement that would be workable between the two of us. Now, what happens in this form of negotiation, in the form of principal negotiation, is we come up with a deal that works for both of us. There's no injury cost to each other. We both come out of it feeling good about it, feeling that okay, we have reached a good agreement, and I have got the requisite value for my car, and Vikash has got a car that he needs. Without really feeling the pinch for it, right? So, what William Urey and Roger Fisher advocate is: let us have principle negotiation. So, let me just show you a small, uh, just one slide. So, separate the people from the problem. Focus on interests, not positions. I hope you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Invent options for multiple gain. Insist on using objective price. Now this is what is called as the pin pyramid. So as you can see, the positions they are like the two peaks of the mountain. There's no meeting point over there. So you're one. You're standing on one peak. I'm standing on one peak, and Vikash is standing on the other peak. So we start exploring our interests. So I start asking Vikash. Vikash, why do you need this car? So Vikash tells me that look, my kids, I have a car, but I need one more because I need to, you know, send my kids to school. So we start understanding why this is important for Vikash and why it's important for me to sell this car. So once we understand our interest, you can see that there is an overlapping. So there is a possibility. I can I can just give you a small example of a, a mediation that I did where we could explore these interests. And here was a Uh, it was a, a matrimonial mediation, and I think yesterday Justice Roshan Dalvi had 
dealt about these custody matters and all that. So this was something involving a child. They had a five-year-old child. And they were able to reach an agreement on, on almost all aspects, including the alimony, the maintenance, the child support, the custody of the child was with the mother. So all that was agreed upon between them. Now, peculiarly, one of the demands of the wife was that, I want my husband's house settled in my son's name. So the husband was saying, no, I cannot do that. This is my ancestral property. It came to me after my father's death. It will go to my son after my death, not in my lifetime. I cannot give it. And additionally, she also wanted him to vacate and give the house to them to live in. So when we asked this lady, why is this important to you? What is making you ask for this house? Interestingly, she came up with a, which actually on hindsight, sounds so uh, small, I won't call it a trivial, but it was a rather small issue because she said, that this is a very posh locality and my son is going to a school in this location, which is a very good school. And we spent a lot of money to get him admitted in this school. I don't want to take him away from the school and I cannot afford a house in this location. So I have found a house that is about 12 or 13 kilometers away. So every day I will have to drive and reach here, or come by bus or whatever means of transport that's available to me, drop my son, go for my work. Afternoon, I have to come back and pick up my son. So, what about the child's safety? What happens if I leave the child on the, you know, if the, if the child is just left at the school here, nobody is there. Somebody from the school will have to wait till I come. And what if nobody is there? So, what happens to my child? So, when the father heard this, he said, the child's safety is important for me too. So, here's what I offer. He said that I will. Let her identify a house in this location. And in addition to what all I have offered, I'll pay the rent for the houses and the rental advance. So every month I will remit the rent. She doesn't have to worry about the rent. Let her stay here because my son's safety is equally important to me. <laughs> so the positions here, I always give this example. Some of you have heard me before may find it boring. But, you know, it's, it's a very classic example of how when we move parties from their position and we come to their interests, we find that there is an overlapping area here, the interest and needs. So here is what is called as the zone of possible agreement. <coughs> here is where there is the possibility of parties reaching an agreement. So here is where you start inventing options. You start generating options. You start discussing with the parties that, okay, so we have understood that this is your interest. So how do we resolve it? So what are the options that we have now? So invent multiple options, right? So I'll stop the screen share. Now, what happens when you are a mediator? So as a negotiator, you remember these principles and you say that, okay, this is not going to be about you and me. It's going to be about solving the problem. So how are we going to approach the problem? What are we going to do? Let's collaborate with each other. This is something that, affect, that is affecting both of us. Let's find a solution. To that. So you work with each other and you invent multiple options. You test those options to see whether they, they are objective. And uh, th there's a neutral value attached to that. And you reach an agreement. Now, when you're facilitating a negotiation, as a mediator, basically, what are you doing? You're facilitating a negotiation between the parties. So what are those things that you need to do as a mediator, as a facilitator? Because you're not a negotiator. It is not your problem. Normally in a negotiation, the negotiation takes place between two people who have a problem. Now as a mediator, you're a neutral third party and you're not affected by the problem as such. So you're somebody who's neutral, who has nothing to do with the problem. All you're doing is trying to facilitate the negotiation. Now first and foremost, what you need to do is start asking those important questions to the parties. 
to be able to move them from their positions to understanding what their interests are. So some very critical questions that you need to ask. Just one or two questions I'll give you as an example, which I have told you already. The first question is, what is the most important thing to you? And why is it so important? And what happens if you don't get it? These three questions will, of course, I'm just putting it in a very simple way. It is not so simple when you're actually doing a mediation. It can become quite a complex process of asking questions. The key to mediation is asking the right questions. So when you start asking these questions, you're able to help the parties to understand that, okay, this is my position and this is what I have demanded. But what is my real interest? Why is this important? For me? What is the best possible solution that I can come up with? So you move the parties from their positions to their interests. And then you sit with the parties and tell them that, okay, now we have understood that this is very important for both of you and we need to find a solution. So what are the options that you propose? And enable them to generate more options. Now here, sometimes people say that, you know, you mediator moves from a purely facilitative uh, mode of operation to something that is more evaluative. But my feeling is that if you don't do it, because sometimes you may, you know, while you're uh, discussing the options with the parties, sometimes parties may look to you for suggestions. And sometimes you are compelled to give your suggestion. Nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't tell the parties that this is what you need to do. You can tell the parties, why don't you consider this? So there is a difference between these two you know, ways of expressing it. So you help the parties to generate the option. Now, what is more important here is, as a mediator, you need to keep in mind that there are seven elements which are involved in negotiation. So as a facilitator of negotiation, you're looking out for these seven elements to understand how to take the negotiation forward. The first two elements are called as the connecting elements. One is communication, and the second is relationship. So what kind of communication is happening between the parties? How are they talking to each other? Is it hostile? Are they friendly? Have they been friendly? Has there been any miscommunication between them? Has there been any misunderstanding that has come up due to any miscommunication? So here is where your techniques of reframing, paraphrasing, summarizing, all these things come into play. Because when you're listening to the party, and you, as you're applying these techniques, you get to understand or you help to restore the communication between them. You create a safe environment by laying down the ground rules and telling the parties that all communication should be respectful and uninterrupted. So you create a safe environment for them and you use your listening techniques, active listening techniques to help them to understand each other's perspective. So first thing requirement is understanding how the communication. The second aspect is what is the relationship between the parties? Is it a one-off contract? Something like just buying and selling something from which a dispute has arisen and the parties are not going to be dealing with each other here afterwards. They're not going to be having any relationship after this. Or is it something that is more uh, sustained, that is going to be lasting for some time? So what kind of relationship do they have? And how do we you know, establish the trust between the parties? What kind of communication is required to help them to improve their relationship? How important is this relationship for them? So understanding the relationship between the parties becomes a very important thing. So these are the communicating elements. Simultaneously, 
you're also looking at what are the alternatives for the past. What happens if they don't reach an agreement today? If they are not able to resolve their issues, what are the options available for them? Are they going to go to the court? Are they going to go for arbitration? Are they just going to live with the problem, with the dispute? What are the other options that are available to them? A good negotiator, if a party is a good negotiator, the party will always come prepared with his or her batna and batna. Batna is best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Batna is worst alternative to a negotiated agreement. There are several other ratnas like malatna, most likely alternative. There is ratna, realistic alternative. So when you're when you're dealing with the party, if supposing you find that you know either they have no understanding of what their alternatives are, or they have an exaggerated understanding of their alternatives. Or they regard their alternatives as too weak. You work with the party to help them to understand that these are your alternatives. So through a process of questioning, you help them to understand what their batna is, what their batna is. Once you're able to work with them and help them to understand the alternatives, from that emerges a commitment. So the parties then become committed to whatever settlement they reach. So these are called the choosing elements. If I have a very strong alternative, if I have a very good case, which is going to be upheld by the court, why should I settle? My alternative is very good. If I have a very weak case, it's important for me to settle. So understanding their alternatives helps them to move forward. Now, if supposing a party feels very strongly and says that, yeah, my partner is very strong and I have, you know, I'm going to win this case and the court is going to award me. Now, how are you going to recover it? Perhaps the court may award it or the arbitrator may award it, but how are you going to recover it? What is the most likely outcome of this? How long is it going to take you? To recover them. So this helps them to understand that what they perceive as their batna may not really be their batna or the best alternate. So it becomes important for you to work with the parties to understand their batna, their alternatives, and understand their commitment to the settlement that may be reached between them. So these are called as the choosing elements. Now, once you have a clear understanding of what the connecting elements are and what the choosing elements are, then on the table, you have what are called as the crafting elements. Now, these are the elements that you use to craft a settlement between the parties. So the first one is, what are the interests of the parties? I don't want to repeat that because I've already told you what are the interests. So what are the options that are there before the parties? And what are the standards for evaluating those options? That is the objective criteria. So what you do is you use these interests, options, and standards to help them to craft an agreement between themselves. Something that will help them to reach a conclusion that would work for both of them. So what is very important in a mediation for a mediator is to understand the concept of principle negotiation and to guide the party in such a way that they are able to understand what really is good for them, help them to move from their position to their interests and needs, help them to generate as many options as they can to find a resolution. And also help them to evaluate those options from a very objective perspective so that when they come out with an agreement, they are satisfied or that, okay, this is the best thing that could have happened. To me. And I could not have got a better deal anywhere. 
so the mediator's role becomes a very uh, a complex role because in spite of not being a negotiator a mediator needs to possess the negotiation skill to help the parties to number one move from their position for which the mediator has to deal with their cognitive biases use communication skills like active listening reframing paraphrasing summarizing reflecting all these skills you need to use to help them to come out of their positions and identify what their real interests and needs are and then help them to generate options test those options it becomes very important to test the options whether these options are workable because normally what we do is we do uh, what is called as brainstorming but today brainstorming is not regarded as a good word because it's connected to you know what happens to an epileptic patient so uh, globally now they use the word called thought shower so you have shower of thoughts so one of the techniques that we use is we tell the parties that okay you come up with options okay don't worry about uh, whether people will laugh at your options or whether it's workable or not workable don't worry about that just come up with as many options as you can and we make a list of the options and then we take each of these options and we test those options and how we test those options is by applying what is called as a smart test so is this option specific does it you know encompass in it an accurate description of what exactly is need to be done or what what actually is the transaction going to be or what exactly is the value that is going to be exchanged is it specific in terms of time in terms of who does what that is the s the m stands for measurable can it be quantified is there a value attached to it the third thing is is it achievable can the party really fulfill that a party may agree that okay i'll pay a, a compensation of 20 crores now do you have that kind of money how are you going to raise the money have you made arrangements for it so is it achievable is it realistic a husband sitting there might say that if my wife comes back to me i'll take her to the moon for a honeymoon well you're not elon musk or richard branson to be able to do that so is it realistic what you're offering is it something that is within the boundaries of the law the last one is is it time bound so it has to be specific in respect of what is the time frame within which the parties are able to will be able to achieve a closure so you apply the smart test and see whether the parties are reaching an agreement and then you you know each of these options you apply the smart test and then you zero in an option that both parties feel is workable for both and once you are able to do that once again apply the test a second time to ensure that you have not missed out on anything <clears throat> so who are all the parties involved who is supposed to do what when is it supposed to be done <coughs> excuse me how is it supposed to be done what happens if you don't do it all these terms have to be a part of the agreement that you reach so just to summarize what we have discussed so far what we have spoken about is one there is soft negotiation there is hard negotiation and this is what we normally do when we negotiate now there is a third option before us which is called as principle negotiation where the effort or the you know the endeavor is to ensure that you know both sides don't come out feeling injured or damaged or you know uh, feeling bruised out of the negotiation Some, so everybody gets something out of the negotiation so it is called as principle negotiation 
and in the principal negotiation the techniques that you use is first of all you you identify the problem and keep the focus on the problem and not on the people to separate the people from the problem then you move the parties from their positions to the interest to focus on the interest and negotiate on the interest never on the position then you also you know uh, invent multiple options don't get bogged down by any one option so you try to create more value in the negotiation and then you establish an objective criteria for evaluating and assessing what exactly is the subject matter of the negotiation you are also conscious of the seven elements there that are involved in the negotiation <laughs> which are broadly speaking the excuse the connecting elements the choosing elements and the crafting elements the connecting elements are the relationship and the communication between the parties the choosing elements are the alternatives and their commitment and the crafting elements are the interest options and the standard system plan the objective plan so once you get the parties to a point where they are able to understand their interest that is where you start generating options with them you encourage them to come up with several options more options than one at least then you test those options by applying the smart test so you zero in on an option that is the best for both parties and you reach an agreement and the agreement has to be specific in terms of who the parties are what their obligations are who supposed to do what when they are supposed to do it how they are supposed to do it everything has to be specifically put down in the agreement Now, just one aspect that I would like to touch upon before we conclude, Vikas, if you have just two minutes, we don't have any timeline. You have to negotiate the time because you have to leave at five thirty. Ah, uh, yeah. No, because there, there, we need to give some scope for the questions also. Now, I'm reading this very interesting book called Social Intelligence by Daniel Goldman, and he is talking about the mirror neurons that are there in our brain. and he talks about you know two pathways of signals that reach between us uh, that uh, help us to interact with each other one is the low road and the other is the high road the low road is purely instinct based now if i say roshan ma i see roshan ma'am on the screen she's smiling i understand that she's agreeing with me and i will automatically i will smile back at her okay now in person it happens more effective so if i am relaxed <coughs> in a negotiation now that relaxation rubs off on the other party also whether you like it or not the other party is going to relax if you regard the other party as an adversary automatically it will build up the tension in your brain and that tension will be communicated to the other party automatically through the low road circuit now the low road circuitry helps them to analyze that through the high road circuitry and understand that okay this person is hostile to me so i need to be on my guard i need to be careful about what i say i need to watch out whereas if you go with an open mind automatically it rubs off on the other part of the other part you can see this walk on the road just walking on the road just look at a stranger and smile 99.9% you will get a smile in return okay so neuroscience plays a very important role in negotiation and if you want to be a good mediator or a negotiator it becomes important for you to understand how these things work so how you are able to communicate yourself so it's it becomes very important when you walk into a negotiation or when you are walking as a mediator walk in with a positive attitude with an open mind 
with the feeling that we are all friends here. And we are going to be discussing a solution that we need to find for a problem that's facing all of us. So walk with that state of mind and invariably you'll find the going good. So that's the last thing I wanted to say. And thank you for your patience in listening to me. I hope I made some sense. I really don't know because uh, the cough syrup is making me a little... <laughs> I had to take two coffees to get rid of the grogginess in my brain. <laughs> I hope I didn't pass off that to you. <laughs> yeah, Vikash. Yeah, yeah. I'm done. Uh, your session, needless to say that it's uh, they are all spot on. Despite the ill health, you should, the passion to take things forward is self-explicit. And before I will just conclude in the normal style, I will ask because I know that when Justice Roshan Dalvi is there, the best way is to ask her because the way she sums up is the best way to negotiate with the today's conclusion part. <laughs> Thanks, Vikas. I wanted to sum up like this. Yeah, you see, this facilitation and negotiation process is today called festipulate. And that is a portmanteau between facilitation and manipulation. Generally, we take manipulation in a very negative uh, way. But uh, what uh, Mr. Javad said was actually manipulation for positive results for both parties. And that would be festipulate. And the other thing I wanted to say is that there is one Roger Meyer's book on negotiation, how to get the best of everything or something like that. Uh, and he has given several uh, ways of negotiating for, you know, our kind of matters, you can say. The matters which come up in courts, which uh, where the bottom line is money. And uh, just as uh, he said, the uh, negotiation for, let us say, this car or whatever, it was very nicely put that this is, uh, what was it called, principled negotiation. We get a particular um, uh, court. And now that court is the value of the property. It may be, of course, immovable property, movable property, whatever. One party gives the value, other party gets the choice. Or they go to a third party, like, you know, he went to the car uh, uh, mechanic or whatever. And then the third party's thing is binding on both the parties. If they say it is not binding, then about 10% like this. You're in there. They, they settle. The other thing is if there are more properties, then what happens? And there are disputes. It comes about in, say, cases of um, 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 inheritance or things like that. Then also there are those principled ways. You know? If there are four properties, then one party can choose one and fourth. He will get the first and the fourth choice. The second party will get the second and the third choice. So these are objective criteria. And they work out in this uh, principled manner. So you see what he said was completely right and different ways of looking at the same thing. I think those who bring sunshine to the lives of others cannot keep it from themselves. Thanks. Yeah. So, Jawad, what I earlier said and Mamal summed up so beautifully. Very nice. Yeah. The art of structuring, like in the advocacy, they say that you have to learn the art of structuring your thoughts. But the art of structuring the negotiation, evaluating that, taking into consideration the different options. Somehow, if you actually deeply also examine, then there is quite overlapping of the same thought process going in the, while you are drafting it, while you are so much so as a lawyer, once the fees is also been negotiated. So if one learns this art, uh, a lot of lawyers will learn the art of negotiating that also, the way it is put across. And actually not the fees, but the understanding, the sentiment, where does actually he wants to speak. So once who learns that art of patience as a mediator would also be a good lawyer. And needless to say that you are yourself a good trained mediator, mediator, and above all, such a niche in the advocacy. 
So without taking much time, since we know that Mr. Jawad, despite the pressing engagements and coupled with his health, uh, as we could see, despite the cuff, etc., I am reminded of Anil Kumble, who was injured. He comes back, plays well, and helps India. So thank you, everyone. Stay safe. That passion to teach, one should learn from Jawad. And the passion to learn, we should learn from Mrs. Roshan Dalvi. She can don all things well while she teaches us the head sessions, they are beautiful. While she inculcates from the others, that is also a thing to be seen. And the summing up of the issues are also very beautifully done by all, always on this platform. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Mr. Jawad. And thank you to all those who have been connected with us. Stay safe, stay blessed. Namaskar. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was everyone. nice hearing you.